Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. And I'm really sorry to interrupt that song. I mean, we should perhaps have just let it play out. Um, thanks all for joining us for this regular Friday lunchtime Sensemaker Live thinking in partnership with Santander. Uh, thanks Nimo for those great slides. I'm really, I'm so struck always by the sort of compression uh, in time uh, of the commercial space races compared with the Cold War space race. And, and it's one of many things that I'm sure we'll get to this hour when we're talking about why go to space? When I when I said to my wife this morning, hey, we're talking about space at the thinking at lunchtime, she sort of pulled a face and said, some pretty serious stuff going on in the world at the moment. To which I sort of replied, yes, I know. Uh, and everybody knows that. Uh, and also space is sometimes serious in and of itself. But in any case, to the news on Sunday, that is two days from now, um, uh, something else is happening, I think, on, on Sunday. But one thing that's happening on Sunday is that Richard Branson personally and a few passengers will leave this earth and fly with the help of a mothership to uh, 55 miles above the surface of the earth in the VSS Unity spaceship. And I guarantee that right or wrong, whether it works out or not, There'll be headlines about that, about that flight uh, on the following day. And then on the 20th of this month, uh, the richest man in the world and his brother and a mystery guest and the inimitable Wally Funk, 82 years old, trained as a Mercury astronaut in the 60s, but never been allowed to go to space, will go to space, or at least to the edge of it, in Bezos's Blue Origin rocket. So... This is the new commercial space race made flesh, as it were. A lot of column inches have been written about it, but it is actually happening now. And in a sense, our question today is, is it worth it? Um, I think we can sort of compartmentalize robotic space exploration. Um, well, I know one of our guests uh, works in a field which benefits all the time enormously from it. And we, 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 it's, it's not off limits as a subject to discuss, but I don't think anybody really doubts the value of uh, the probes that go up into space and explore the cosmos for us, the satellites that look back and measure our planet. What we're really asking today is, is space exploration worth it? when we put astronauts in spacesuits and have to worry about them. So there's a lot to talk about. There, there is this immediate sort of next chapter of, of the human space race. Uh, I'd like to get on, if people want to, to talk about whether there's any point at all in going back to the moon and a, um, uh, admit, admittedly a personal uh, obsession of mine, uh, should we, could we, will we go to Mars? Is, is it a brilliant idea or, or a bonkers idea? I should declare uh, a slight personal interest in my last job, whenever I ran out of ideas to suggest to the editor of the Times for a, for a leader, I'd say, can we do space? And if he was feeling indulgent, he'd say, okay. And I would write one about the case for going to Mars. And I would generally recycle the Everest argument. We need to go because Mars is there. Um, and I appreciate that in the age of COVID and climate change, uh, that is beginning perhaps to look a little bit shallow. Uh, some would say childish. Nonetheless, um, I cleave to it, um, uh, but I will try not to make my own views on this uh, uh, dominate the conversation. Um, as I say, we've got some great guests who I'll introduce uh, as we come to them. Uh, housekeeping, this is a thinking for any of you who may not have been to one before. We want to hear from you. Um, use the chat function. Um, Phoebe is in there monitoring the chat right now. Um, one of my co-founders, uh, my, my colleague and co-founder, um, I, I could, not my co-founder, I didn't co-found Tortoise, I'm sorry, my boss. Uh, Katie Vanek Smith is on the phone and she has views on this. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and uh, you can also obviously raise your electronic hand and we'll come to you there. But please, please pitch in. I want to know what you think uh, and 
uh, the first way that we're going to do that is to do a quick poll. So um, can we please put the poll up on the screen and I can invite you to uh, answer the question. This is great. I've never been on this end of a poll before. I, I'm just looking at the results. Uh, and I guess it's up to me when I stop it. Is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, share results. So 85% of us at the beginning of the hour believe human space travel is worth it. 15 don't. Um, perhaps we're a self-selecting sample uh, of enthusiasts. Let's find out what we think uh, at the end of the hour. Let me come first, if I may, to Dr. Matt Bothwell, who's very kindly joined us, I think actually from Cambridge, Matt? Uh, yes, that's right. Um, I'm based at the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge University. Hi. Uh, where really you nice are, that, well, it's great to right. have you. you, where you are a public or perhaps the public astronomer. Um, from your perspective, as an astronomer, presumably reliant on uh, the technology that allows us to look outwards, is there actually any point in people going to space? Um, I, so for me, the answer is an unequivocal yes. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm very much part of that 85%. Um, I think astronomers um, tend to have this very long view uh, of, of human progress. Um, and while you know there there are of course kind of complications and issues about the space race as it is at the moment, I think from a zoomed out perspective, if you look at the history of the human the human race as a whole and considering our long future, I think the I, I think it's very very clear that we have to go to space, and I think the alternative is almost unthinkable um, if we want the human race to survive long term in this universe then existing on one single planet is almost putting all of your eggs in one cosmic basket, right? Uh, confining our entire species and the future of our species to one single planet is quite a dangerous thing to do, right? As, as we just go and ask the dinosaurs. Um, I think going to Mars, I think is a, is a very important goal for the, for the coming century. I think Mars is likely to be the first step. Um, I see no reason why we shouldn't be hoping to explore the solar system and beyond um, in the coming millennia. So. Um, yeah, for, from, from my point of view, uh, taking the long view of the, the future of the human race, I think going to space um, is something we absolutely have to do. That's really interesting. And actually, uh, I'm, I'm kind of surprised to, to hear you be that enthusiastic, given your, your specialism. I, I read uh, um, earlier, this, earlier this morning um, that they could have put seven Hubble, te Hubble telescopes in space for the price of putting one in space if that deployment had been robotic rather than involving astronauts on a space shuttle. As an astronomer, wouldn't you rather have more kit up there so that you can see more of the universe? Um, so, I mean, the answer would absolutely, absolutely always be yes. Uh, putting humans in space is very difficult and expensive, right? I mean, we can put robots on Mars, I was going to say cheaply, maybe cheaply is the wrong word to use when you're spending billions of dollars to put robots on Mars, but you know, robots don't require these inconvenient things like food and water and oxygen, so right. it is much cheaper to put robots on Mars, and I think robots are always going to be the leading edge of our exploration, but in, in, terms, in terms of, like I said, the, the long view, I think sending people is always going to be, uh, always going to be the thing to do. Um, you are completely right, putting kit up there is, is going to be uh, a number one goal, but even these, these days, even putting kit up there is expensive. Um, we're a few months away from the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is like Hubble 2.0, if you like Hubble's successor, mm -hmm. uh, which fingers very much crossed is going to be launching at the end of October. Um, James Webb has cost about $10 billion, which is far more than Hubble did, and that's, that's an entirely robotic or not autonomous telescope. So I think th things are very expensive either way, um, and I think the, the question of putting kit in space and humans in space almost feel like two two different areas at this point, I think. Uh, this is a, a key point, I think, um, ab about the current space race, the three competitors who are written about ad nauseam, is, is and you mentioned that the cost of getting up there, hasn't SpaceX brought that down or does that not affect sort of your line of work? I mean, the, the claim is that by reusing rockets, He's lowered the cost of delivering uh, cargo to orbit by a factor of about 10. 
Um, yes, you, you are absolutely right. So SpaceX is bringing costs down um, more than ever ever before. I think when, when at least for, for my line of work, considering putting these very uh, kind of expensive, uh, complicated telescopes um, into space, uh, having cheaper launches is, is always going to be a good thing. But the launch is not the primary cost involved, right? So like, as, like I said, the, the James Webb Space Telescope comes to about $10 billion. The, uh, the cost of launching it into space is a relatively small fraction of that cost. So cheaper launches are always a good thing, of course, but um, it's, it's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be cost and cost by 50% or something. It's, it's a relatively small saving compared to how expensive the tech really is. Right. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much. We'll, we'll come back to you. I, I'd like to come next to, to Sophie Allen, if I may. Sophie is head of learning and teaching at the National Space Academy and uh, is being beamed to us from the National Space Academy in, uh, as you can see, in, in Leicester. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, as an educational tool, uh, does it help to have humans involved? Does it sort of juice the subject up in the classroom? Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, um, our, our director always likes to use the phrase that there are two things that really get kids inspired, especially when they're quite young, and that's dinosaurs and space. And the dinosaurs are extinct and possibly partly extinct because they didn't have their own space program, if we're being honest. So um, space itself is, is really inspirational and really fascinating. But there's something about human spaceflight, about, you know, crewed missions, about sending humans up there to, to get that experience that is, is really special and makes it connect on a more visceral nature with, with young people. I mean, you can learn about nebulae and stars. And if you're the, the kind of kid that's going to be into that, it's, it's going to be amazing. And, you know, you get these stunning images from Hubble and hopefully from October onwards from the Webb telescope as well. Um, but there's something about having humans up there doing it as well that, that I think brings it home and makes it a little bit more tangible as well. You know, it's, it's a secondary line. There's an aspirational quality to it of, of a kid being sat in a classroom thinking, well, I, I could maybe go into space. You know, if I, if I study science, if I study maths, if I, you know, start studying languages, because that's a key skill for astronaut these days. So there's, there's a huge aspirational impact that human spaceflight has. And I've certainly seen it with two big things with the students that I've been working with. The first was Tim Peake's mission to the International Space Station. The UK Space Agency had a massive education project with various different arms. We were one of them. We sent some educational experiments up with Tim to the International Space Station for him to do. And millions of students were reached by this program and you know, inspired to get involved in science, technology, engineering, and maths, um, and to you know, send code up to a Raspberry Pi that Tim was using up in space and things like this. And you know, that, that was instant and tangible for those students. There was a British astronaut that they could communicate with, and all of a sudden, it became more aspirational for them as well. And the second thing that has really started to catch imaginations has been the, the crewed commercial space program. You know, there, there's something very cool about the space sex technology that, that, that kids really like. And, and the idea that space is becoming more accessible there's, there's been an elitist feel to human spaceflight for a long time. If you wanted to go into space, you had to be you know, part of one of the national space organizations. And now it feels like we're on the cusp of space being opened up to, to more people. And that's tremendously exciting for a lot of young people. Great. Well, I, I'm gonna come back to you in just a second, but I have to ask Louis Simpson, Tim Peake took a photo for you while he was in the ISS. Louise, what of and how did you persuade him? Very easily. I'd actually written to the European Space Agency to ask them um, to ask him to take a photograph for me of Condorcet's um, crater on the moon. And I got quite a funny email back saying, well, we're not really that close, but he's taken this photograph for you. So it was just quite cute, but it did it did reinforce my unbelievable ignorance in sort of thinking that the space space um the iss was much further up than it was oh okay but can you get a better picture of that crater from uh, uh orbit than from earth 
well, I just thought it would be nice because, you know, Condorcet would have appreciated it. I'm writing a book on the French Revolution and the fact uh-huh. that he's a crater named after him. And yes, the photograph at Tim Peake will go in the book if it ever gets published. Great. OK, thanks very much. Um, uh, Sophie, let me come back to you. Um, I mentioned um, the, the context of this discussion, and I know that in the classroom, um, kids are very preoccupied as well by uh, COVID, obviously, because it's part of their lives, but also by climate change. Do you ever see those things colliding in in, in the minds of people doing um, GCSEs and A-levels? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's a conversation that I have on a, a very regular basis is that, you know, students will say it's a classic argument of, why should we put this much money into space when we've got so many problems on the earth that need solving? And, you know, then we get into all kinds of discussions about, okay, well, let's actually look at the money that's spent on space as a fraction of the money that's spent on other things, like, for example, military expenditure or, you know, things like that. And then look at, well, what do we get from space? You know, it's not just um, the importance of exploration, aspiration, and just learning and and wisdom and knowledge. But we get a lot of spin-offs from the space industry. So it, 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 you know, a a lot of technology. Um, So there's, there's, there's a lot of really good conversations that can be had. And it's not an instant shutdown conversation by any means. You know, people's concerns about what is going on at the moment are very, very valid, especially when it comes to, you know, climate change and, and things like that. And it's important to have those conversations. And so it acts as a really good um, kind of gateway to some critical thinking ac- exercises as well and, and debate. So it's certainly something that is on, on a lot of students' minds. Um, and I think it's also something, there seems to be a, a, a preoccupation with the money that's spent on space exploration. I think more so than any other area of scientific Uh, investigation I think that's because it's so large scale you know it's very obvious to see a rocket launching it's not so obvious you know you don't necessarily know when the large hadron collider was last turned on for a for an experiment for example so I think there's a an obvious nature to space exploration that brings it to the forefront of people's minds when that money on science versus money on world problems discussions come come up right uh, yeah, it's a good point. And my colleague, Michael Kowalski, is saying it in the chat, we spend orders of, orders of magnitude more on sports, somewhere between 500 billion and a trillion a year. Um, we can we can discuss those figures. Is it really orders of magnitude uh, even now than we do on space, if that's the point you're making? Um, uh, do let us know. But first, I want to come to Sarah Crudders, who I think has been able to join us, even though I don't see you, Sarah, at the top of my screen. Can you see um, me now? Hi, Sarah. Great Hello, to see you. you. Yes, yes. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, um, journalist, author, most recently of Look Up, our story with the stars, and often on telly talking about space. Thanks very much. Now, I suspect that the space subject that has been most on your mind most recently has been this, this space race between the, the billionaires. Um, is it... Um, isn't it just a bit bonkers? Well, I just want to clarify your introduction there. Um, first of all, I work in the commercial space sector. And second of all, I think the media has got it wrong here. We we had a space race in the 1960s. And when we look about that space exploration, we talk about a race because that's how we've always associated space travel. But actually, what we're seeing is probably more a comparison with the Wild West in the ter- sense that, and it's a crude comparison, but in the sense that there's so many different things you can do. It's not like Apollo where there was that one final goal, seeing a human being land on the moon. It was about politics, not about science. Now it's about extending humanity's presence beyond Earth. It's no longer a race. It's There are so many companies, countries, and individuals now involved in space exploration. If you were to get a map of the Earth and, and color in all of the countries involved in space exploration, you color in most of the countries on Earth. Then when you include individuals and companies, it's it's different to what we've seen before in space exploration, but it's no different to what we've seen on Earth. Governments during exploration tend to go in first and then private industry follows. And this is exactly what we're seeing now. It's not bonkers. You know, humans are built to explore. They're built to go over the hill. They're built to ask questions. And this is just the next step in the same way that we sailed the oceans during the age of exploration. We're now reaching for space. Okay, I I take your point completely. If we sort of take a step back and look at the larger space 
scene and 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 industries related to it but just focusing on the the recent calendar and richard branson's decision to bring forward his launch by a few days um so well, he didn't actually bring forward his launch. Um, they never gave a date. It just worked out perfectly that this was going to be the, the year. They've been testing. Virgin Galactic's been around since the early 2000s. Um, Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin is ever so slightly older than that, but they've been working in stealth mode. You know, Jeff had no public funding, so he didn't need to boast about what he was doing and have that PR campaign in the way that you might see with SpaceX. But um, it, it wasn't... I know it doesn't seem believable, but having spoken to Branson about this, it, it's not about beating Bezos, it's just a wonderful coincidence that things have come together at the right time. Yes, it seems like it was moved forward, but they wouldn't fly if it wasn't safe. The next test flight was always going to have Richard Branson on it, and that is what we're seeing. Um, yes, Bezos, it, it's interesting actually, it is a, you could argue it is a slight PR move because um, Branson plays the PR game, he plays it very well, that's what, that's what Virgin is known for, whereas Jeff Bezos has kind of worked in quiet, he then sets this date, July 20th, the 52nd anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landings. And then suddenly that gives Branson a goalpost to walk towards. But they were always planning on having Branson on the first passenger mission like this. He was always going to be on this flight and they're only flying because it's as safe as it can possibly be. Do you nonetheless uh, worry at all about how it'll pan out on Sunday? No because this is, we're pushing forward into a, a new frontier and yes, risks are to be accepted, but this is about pushing, you know, that's like asking any explorer, have they worried about doing anything? You know, this space race, lives will be lost, fortunes will be lost, fortunes will be made, heroes will be made, but it's it's what we do as a species. It's, it's what we, you know, they wouldn't go if they didn't think it was as safe as it could possibly be. There've been hundreds of engineers working on this thing. And also this is private money. This is not government money going into this, um, to Branson's flight or to Blue Origin's flight. This is a new era in space exploration, which, you know, to date, fewer than 600 humans have ever been to space. More than 100 million, 100 billion of us have existed in the entire history of our species. Fewer than 600 have been to space, but because of commercial space flight, because of people willing to take the risk financially and, and sometimes um, put their lives on the line, we're going to see a transformation in the number of people that can actually access space can go to space and with that comes a benefit of how they can go back to their communities and relate to their communities in a way that perhaps a, a military white male american astronaut can't relate to everyone else on earth so it is it's opening up yes it is billionaires going first it's no different to what we've seen throughout history the wealthy will go first prices will come down there are other incentives i i sit on the board of directors of an organization called space humanity with the goal of funding tourist tickets to flights, uh, tourist tickets to space for people from diverse backgrounds. But what it's going to mean is that more people can start to access space. It's no longer the preserve of governments. As Sophie was saying earlier, you know, space almost felt quite elitist. We, I, I'm assuming most of us are British on this call. And if you were born in Britain, you couldn't really become an astronaut. I mean, yes, we've got Helen Charman and Tim Peake and a few others who became Americans to go to space, but there was a limit on this. And this crew go with Branson, half of them are British. You've got Colin Bennett, who's the lead engineer, and then also Dave Mackay, who's the late lead pilot. This is a, a British space mission, um, as much as it is a commercial one. And what we will see is a change in the type of person that can go to space. However, I will caveat that by saying, if we're to succeed as a species in exploring space, then space needs to be for everyone. It can't just be for one niche group because we won't succeed we'll leave people behind and, and space is bigger than any one company or individual so what i'm hoping and what i'm optimistic about with the work that i do certainly in the us is that this new commercial era in, in space tourism for want of a better word will mean more people from more diverse backgrounds can access space which will help make space for all of us and the more people who understand why space matters and why we're doing this the more we'll succeed in exploring beyond earth because why we you know we're so privileged to be alive today in a time when going to space is no longer something you dream about it's something that is possible and when you look up at the night sky for pretty much every single star you can see when you look up we, we think there's at least one planet orbiting around it we are this one planet in this orbiting this one average star in a universe which is impossibly large to imagine to comprehend and, and why wouldn't you want to know what is out there and all of us alive today are part of that, part of that beginning of humans exploring beyond Earth. Uh, Sarah, I, I share your excitement and I, I want to um, 
ask you one more question though about the safety aspect. Uh, after that, I'm interested by what Rupert Warden Hill is saying in the chat. And Rupert, um, I'd really like to ask you uh, in, a, in a second, if you had a choice between these three uh, uh, rockets, which one you'd take. But, but first, Sarah, you clearly understand and accept um, the risk involved. And, and the participants do, including presumably Branson. But do you think, do you think the public understands that space travel remains inherently extremely dangerous? Because Branson has a way of talking about it as if it was just getting on, on a Virgin Atlantic airliner to go to New York. But I, it's absolutely I, not. I mean, one of his test pilots was killed in 2014. Well, the, the test pilot who was killed was actually working with the spaceship company, a, second, a secondary company who wasn't working for Virgin Galactic at the time. I think it's important to differentiate. Second of all, Branson has acknowledged the risk. Um, I will give you the, the caveat that, yes, I think the general public have become used to space because it has been part of our lives for so long. We see many successes. But we've also witnessed many failures in space exploration. Um, but just because something's risky, just because something's hard, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And if people taking those risks, if they're not affecting anyone else, why does it concern you? We are pushing forward a new frontier and there is always going to be risk with space exploration. There is always going to be risk with opening up new frontiers. But there are people willing to take those risks and by pushing forward in science, technology, innovation, exploration, that eventually trickles down and benefits all of us. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Rupert, can I come to you? You say in the chat that um, you're very interested in space. Um, uh, do you, are you have you kind of read up all about the Virgin Galactic and the Blue Origin and, and the SpaceX rockets? Do you have a favorite? Well, I mean, I have to say those are three very big companies. And if I had to choose one, I would go for the SpaceX uh, rocket because it's really well uh, like designed because it's reusable and uh, it's very clever the uh computers in it are just amazing i've seen i've got a book uh by uh eric berger called liftoff and it's about elon musk and there are loads of really cool diagrams in there and it's amazing how uh like how much detail there is in it but also i have to say that not many people talk about it, but there's something called the U United Launch Alliance, which mm -hmm. does launch uh, many of the, yeah, loads of the satellites uh, that are in orbit at the moment. And I think that that's also a very good contender for uh, the companies that should uh, like help to take us to Mars. Okay, that's it. That yeah, I mean, as I understand it, the, the United Launch Alliance is is the big daddy, right, of, of all this. It, it, it uses a lot of the resources of NASA and uh, and to, to get really big rockets and big payloads into space. But um, I'm interested that you focus on this reusable nature of, of SpaceX, because to me, that is what has really changed everything. And, and my favorite YouTube clip of any YouTube clip is uh, the one where um, you've got the SpaceX Falcon Heavy going up with the three yeah. boosters and they all land. I mean, it's, uh, you know the one I mean, right? Yeah, it's um, that video is incredible. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but I think that the reason uh, reusability is so important is you, you have like a plane, a jumbo jet, and you, they're so expensive to manufacture. And if you uh, had lots of people that went onto the plane, you flew it and then you landed it and then you just threw it away. That wouldn't be cost effective in the slightest, would it? It just wouldn't be useful. I know it's not the same because rockets go into outer space and they have a lot of, they have a very uh, lot of, uh, pressure on them to do the perfect job because planes they can go slightly off course but then they can go back on course but rockets if they go off course they're going to be done for but i mean just reusability it's so important to keep the space race going as you were saying uh because if we don't have that feature on all of our rockets i think that it's going to be very expensive and it's going to 
drain most of our resources if we want to go to Mars. Ah, I want to come to Mars. Thank you very much, Rupert. Let, can I come back to Sarah? Um, I want to ask in a sort of uh, uh, fundamental sense, which aspect of the upsurge, I'm not going to call it a space race, I'm going to call it an upsurge in commercial, private sector commercial activity in space, um, is to you the, the game changer? Do, I mean, do you agree, for example, that SpaceX's proven ability to reuse rockets, like Rupert was talking about, fundamentally changes the, the economics of the whole game? Well, absolutely. Um, SpaceX's goal is to reduce the cost of launch by 10x, um, so it'd be 10 times less expensive to launch payloads into space. And we're not just looking at sending astronauts to space. It's not just about astronauts going and doing science on the International Space Station or, or one day returning to the moon and then onwards to Mars. It's about utilizing space and the vantage point that near Earth orbit does uh, gives us to actually benefit life on Earth. So what we're seeing, um, not just with SpaceX, um, as Rupert mentioned ULA, there are lots of other Ariane Spass as well, lots of other launch providers, is once we get the cost of launch down, that means that more payloads can get to space, more ideas, more science, and that science generally benefits life on Earth. If we go back to the internet era in the 1990s, it was free pretty much for kids in a dorm room to have a business idea, to set up that business and transform the world in ways we couldn't imagine. And that's what we're seeing with space exploration, certainly with um, the reduced the cost of access to space. Once we get that low enough, it means that more people with more ideas can get those ideas into space. Much of those ideas will utilize data looking back at Earth to understand more about our planet, to, to use data to, to benefit life on Earth. And we'll have more businesses, more ideas getting payloads in space. And we can't imagine what is going to come. Just in, in the same way in the 1990s, we couldn't imagine the world we live in today. Like I'm sat in East London in my apartment here and I'm talking to you via Zoom. People couldn't imagine that. They might have dreamed about it in science fiction, but it wasn't something we really thought would actually happen. And we're going to see the same thing with this commercial space era. Things that we haven't even begun to imagine yet will transform life on Earth thanks to entrepreneurs and business people being able to get a cheaper, lower cost, more effective way of accessing space. I mean, you've got to credit um, Richard, Gunson's, Richard Branson's other space company, Virgin Orbit, which is looking at reducing small, launching small satellites to space using air launch. There are balloon companies looking at doing the same thing. And the more and more payloads, the more ideas we can get to space, the more benefit there will be for us. Thank you, Sarah. Um, one of the reasons that uh, I seized on this subject for today was because my colleague and the Tortoise co-founder, Casey Vanek Smith, uh, had such very strong views on it. I think she's traveling, listening, but traveling. Um, but my other colleague, Tess Murray, um, promised that she would um, uh, speak up. Excuse me, I'll, I'll just try and, I wish I, wish I knew how to um, turn off a phone, uh, but I don't. Thank go. God you're leading this really high-tech conversation then, Joe. Don't put me in a spacecraft. Um, I'd love to. Um, Tess, uh, channel for us the thoughts of Katie Vanek smith um, I'll summon my inner Katie. I mean, the, 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 what I'm asking you to do is, is explain why it's not worth it. And there are some pretty powerful arguments, aren't there? Um, yeah, well, no, I mean, I know that Katie particularly has particularly strong views about the sort of the, the billionaires race, doesn't she? Right. It's just sort of, you know, once you've bought your private island or half of New Zealand, where else do you go, you know, where else do you go and kind of um, do a land grab and perhaps plot your exit route as a super, you know, as a super rich person? And I agree there's, um, I suppose it comes down to the concerns about this being led by private individuals and their motivation rather than a technological advance that benefits all of us. And, and I don't think any of us would, would disagree in any way at all about the, the wider benefits of the science and the research and the development that's gone into space exploration that has benefited everyone. And I don't know, I right at the beginning of the chat, just before we came on this call, I reread that wonderful letter of note from uh, a reply from, I don't know, someone else will know, the Director of Science at NASA to a, to a Zambian nun in 1970 when she was saying, I can't feed children, why should we be 
extraordinary space is a it's a brilliant letter so but this sort of the visible face of space exploration seems to be hijacked by by some pretty large egos and that in turn creates i think a sense of unease about what's really going on there because of course we know that we've we've virtually drained this planet of all its natural resources so we're we just going on a massive shopping trip at very very high altitude now is it driven by uh, the same motivations that the scientific developments of the past have have led to um, or is this really a natural resources land grab um, ego trip I mean I think that so Katie tweeted earlier, you know, it's just willy waving. And I replied saying, that, well, maybe not all willies are created equal. Um, uh, sorry, that's a slightly random analogy. But anyway, uh, but if you look at sort of um, if you look at SpaceX, for instance, versus Virgin Galactic, one does seem far more like a sort of vanity project rather than to Rupert's point, we're looking for reusable um, technology. I'm personally really interested, and I don't understand it, but I'm really interested in the natural resources sort of angle, because it does seem that the, you know, there was a some sort of South Sea bubble about meteor mining a while ago. What's happened there? Who owns this? Who gets to, who gets to be there? Who gets to harvest space? And what mm. does that mean? And should we be more concerned about? you know what looks like kind of fun and a and a billionaire's play thing and passion project should we actually be really concerned about who is funding and driving this and why and and about the the morals of um uh spending money and energy on extraplanetary exploration when we when we're despoiling our own can i just come back to sophie Alan, in your own view and sort of in your position, able to canvas that of, of, of young people, uh, what, what do you make of the argument that now more than ever, we need to be focusing resources on saving this planet rather than looking at other ones? I think undoubtedly young people today seem more in touch with with the climate change issue and with the with the environmental issues that are facing our planet than I've in my entire 15 year teaching career seen them before in the past. Um, and there's almost with some of them, it's almost a sense of, of kind of climate fatigue in that, yes, we know you've told us there's a problem. We know there's a problem. Some of them have even turned around and gone, we know it's your generation that caused this problem. Um, and they're, they're very, very aware of it. And they are, you know, very into, you know, e well, either some of them are very into trying to, to solve it or figure it out. And some of them are genuinely very depressed about the situation, understandably so. Um, I think what's, what's interesting is that, you know, when you look at planetary exploration, um, you know, we talk a lot about space spin-offs and technology that we can use, you know, um, satellite application data, both from Earth observation standpoint, others is, is a really obvious one. But then when you start to look at some of the, the more technological uh, research that's being done, so for example, uh, right now there's an um, experiment called MOXIE taking place on the surface of Mars, which is looking at how you can take carbon dioxide and uh, break it down into carbon and oxygen. Uh, now, obviously, that's being done on the surface of it from the point of view of potentially in the future, could we take carbon dioxide from Mars's atmosphere and use that, break it down and make it a usable atmosphere for, for a human, um, you know, habitation on the surface. But of course, that kind of research has implications uh, for our planet. We know that we have an issue with carbon sequestration and that we really need to find a way of potentially undoing some of the damage that has been been done. So it's it's not such a clear delineation between if we're spending money on space, we're ignoring, you know, potential uh, climate technologies. Um, it's, I, I, I personally always get frustrated when people take the view of it's one or the other, one or the other. Mm -hmm. you know, space or the environment. It's like, well, there are plenty of other areas that we could look at, at getting money from um, and in terms of, of money spent. So within the UK, we gain back 11 pounds for every pound that we spend and invest in, in space. So from a UK standpoint, space is a moneymaker. It, it, it brings in over 16, um, 16.4 billion now is the, the UK turnover from the space industry. So that money can 
either go back into space or it can go into other research as well. In my view, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Right. That's a really good point. It's not a zero sum game, which is a point sometimes made about HS2, for example. Um, before we carry on, I just wanted to draw people's attention to um, the result of our uh, unscientific poll, um, which shows perhaps, among other things, that the larger tortoise membership doesn't necessarily think the same way as the people who've joined this call. Um, so the question, who should lead space exploration, private companies or national governments? Um, and there is a significant uh, majority uh, favoring private companies. Um, and uh, Matthew Bothwell um, has a problem with that. Can we uh, come back to you, Matthew? Um, because what you said in the in the chat in response to that. Well, you can go ahead and, and give your response. Yeah, thanks. I, I was slightly surprised and maybe a bit alarmed by the uh, by the response. I think the thing on, on the one hand, I think the, the way that people have been alluding to this idea before that with the more recent space race, which is very private company led has led to a, a bit of a democratization of, of space, which is, of course, a good thing. But it's, it's not clear to me that private companies are necessary for democratizing. Um, space, I think, and I think what worries me more than anything is the, the the lack of regulation and oversight that you get when you get these big corporations uh, running these things. Um, if we go back to Elon Musk and uh, SpaceX, of course, making the rocket launches cheaper is a very very good thing. But a lot of the, the other things that SpaceX are doing are maybe not so good. The Starlink project, for example, is this project to put this fleet of uh, low Earth orbit satellites to provide high speed internet. Uh, which I guess we can, the, the, ben, the, the, the benefits and drawback to the internet in, itself, you know, the high speed satellite internet itself are maybe a side, a side issue. But at least for something like ground based astronomy, the Starlink project is a terrible thing, right? There are going to be tens of thousands of these very bright spacecraft in low Earth orbit beaming out uh, these radio waves. Um, it could very well be that in 10 years' time, radio astronomy is impossible from the surface of the Earth. Uh, because of Elon Musk's single person passion project. Um, if this sort of thing was being handled by a government, there would be regulation, there'd be oversight. Um, as it is, uh, almost SpaceX can make this unilateral decision to, uh, to, you know, to do something that's going to profoundly affect the future of humanity and make the night sky very, very different. Um, even in the optical, right? Even just seen in the light with our eyes, there are going to be tens of thousands of these very bright satellites. Um, An astronomer colleague of mine, uh, made the analogy of it's like stringing power lines across Yosemite National Park or something, right? It's taking something that the entire human race owns together as something of, you know, part of our collective ownership of our universe and then putting this kind of, you know, this huge bright corporate branding on it. And there's, there's very little that we can do about it because Elon Musk has decided. I'm very, very wary of letting these billionaires make these unilateral decisions, which will have huge impact for the human race. Uh, and we don't, we don't get much say. This is really interesting, and I'm embarrassed not to have known that there was so little regulation connected with, with that whole, whole venture. Just to be clear, um, uh, was there no, was the FAA not involved in granting permission for this? And was there, was there no consultation, no governmental um, uh, opinion on it at all? So I think there was a limited amount of, of consultation done, but to my, again, I'm not, I'm not a legal expert, to, to, my, to my, as far as I know, maybe some of my co-panelists co know more than me, but as, as far as I know, the area of space law is a bit of a wild west and it's not really clear who has legal jurisdiction about what goes up there. Well, Sarah, you used that phrase wild west um, in a more complimentary way about the, the whole uh, seen. Do you accept that perhaps we need more regulation in some areas? I think we're going to see regulation. Certainly space law is a developing field. The UN's got a department for outer space affairs, but it's kind of a chicken and egg situation because if you have the regulation in too soon, you can't allow a new industry, a completely new industry off, well, you know, off planet, so to speak, to actually develop. So we are seeing, you know, there's a great question, who owns space? Well, the answer is it's comparable to maritime law. We will see that developing, but I think it's really two really important points. One is to remember that space is really hard. You know, the International Space Station, you've got 16 nations, Russia and America, for example, nations that might not get to get, get on together 
on Earth, working together in order to just live in Earth orbit, live in Earth orbit, you know, just to live beyond the Earth. It's really hard to do that. So I think this concern of, oh, a billionaire is going to go and carve up space, it's really hard to do that. It, that's highly unlikely. We are going to see regulation developing and actually we need collaboration in order to succeed in space exploration. And then the, actually, I've got three points. The second point is um, in terms of, billionaires and ego trips has anyone just thought about flipping this on the head and saying these are people who are using their enormous and i've worked with both musk and with bezos and, and with branson as well these are people who are using their enormous wealth to change the future of humanity they could just be living on a private island and, and doing nothing i'm not going to get onto the debate that some i'm sure will have about billionaires and then about wealth but they're using their money to to change the way we get to space to reduce the cost of access to space to democratize access to space branson's already mentioned in his videos that he's put out that after this um mission he's got his mission to space he's going to be making an announcement and how he wants to democratize access to space they're plowing in huge amounts of their own money risking their own lives, risking their own fortunes to open up space exploration for more people. And we need private industry to do that because governments cannot take the same risk that private industry can. Governments have to be accountable for all the money they spend, much mm -hmm. of the money they spend, or at least you hope they will be. They have to be accountable to the risk to human life. Private individuals, private organizations can take the risk that governments cannot. So we need both. We need this combination. I mean, if we want to look at returning to the moon and then eventually seeing human beings on Mars, that will likely be a public-private international partnership. So you'll have a lot of different nations working together as well as private companies. That's the only way we're going to succeed in space exploration. And just to touch quickly on Matt's point about the, the SpaceX, um, the, the satellites which are being used in space to actually bring connectivity, the Starlink satellites. Um, I understand the concerns within the astronomy community and I understand that regulation needs to develop but on the flip side we've got a digital divide in this planet if you talk about benefiting life on earth much many of the people on earth haven't got access to the internet with that they get less education less opportunities but if we can bridge that digital divide which is what the potential that satellites in space have the potential to do by providing internet to the developing world to remote areas of the planet that will benefit life on earth yes there is regulation which needs to be there yes we need to have more consultations with the astronomy communities but we need to also understand why people are doing things and we will see a huge amount of development certainly on the legal framework over the coming decades or so but we just can't put those rules in and i don't think we need to stop saying billionaires are going there to own space they won't be able to do it it's beyond any one individual we need to recognize that people are doing something which is greater than themselves, but they're helping to open up a new frontier. And we should be excited because there's a lot to be miserable about, mm. certainly in the last 18 months. And, and we should be excited about what is to come. The, the space future, we always dreamed of, we got the timing wrong, but it's happening now. And there's a lot to be excited about. There's a lot to motivate young people about. And it's we've got a front row seat in a new era of humanity. Right. Um I want to come to Yelena Sofronievich in just a second, but I, I should say, I, uh, uh, Sarah, sh share your excitement. And, and if, if you want a sense of how different everything is in space now from versus 30 years ago, read Ashley Vance's biography of uh, Elon Musk. Um, the, it, it's just extremely exciting to see how they're able to do stuff so much more quickly. Uh, than NASA as a public sector body was uh, in terms of developing the science, in terms of ambition, in terms of going from idea to, to, to blast off. Quite extraordinary. Yelena, unusually for you, uh, if, if you're there, are you there, Yelena? Yelena you seem to be on the, on the fence. You're saying you have been labeled a space skeptic in the past um, for reasons to do with the masculinity of, of the protagonists. Where, where do you stand now? No, I think I realised that I'm not a space sceptic. That was kind of a self-label, to be fair. We were we were producing some things about space with work, and I was very sceptical about um, just focusing on, on Bezos and Musk and the likes of that, because 
like I said, I, I realise that it's not space much that I'm obviously sceptical of. And, and to be fair, I'm not a space denier. I'd like to put that out there. I, I appreciate that there is space. Um, but I don't like the fact that, like we've said before, the discourse is dominated by um, these big figures. And I think Tessa summarised it perfectly in the Billionaires Playground. But what I want to touch on more is Matt's really interesting point there about the lack of oversight in this. Um, I don't think that the mo most people do see space as a collective public good. Um, just in the same way that most people don't see the environment as a collective public good or a public health good even. And we're seeing at the moment how difficult it is to retroactively hold businesses to account for, um, for the damage that they have caused the environment. And I just worry, I appreciate Sarah's point of not wanting to hinder exploration and hinder initiative. But I worry that we're going to see exactly the same issue crop up with space in the future when it comes to environmental concerns. Interesting. Thank you, Yelena. Now, before we run out of time, uh, I want to come back to uh, Sophie. I want to address a couple of very specific points about Mars. Now, Sophie, I know you're a physicist, but I want you to pretend you're a biologist. OK. <laughs> is, it not, is it not the case that we are fundamentally ill-suited to human space exploration? Once we get beyond uh, Earth orbit, we're vulnerable to radiation, uh, and cosmic cosmic rays in a way that we will never have been before for a long time. And there are massive hurdles still to be overcome in that respect. Yeah, without, without a shadow of a doubt. So at the end of the day, we are squishy, gas-filled uh, membranes with chemical reactions going on inside of us that drive everything. And if we wanted to go to Mars, for example, average surface temperature about minus 60 degrees, freezing. We need oxygen to be able to breathe. Well, over 95% of the atmosphere is CO2. Without uh, a thick atmosphere, we neither have the air pressure to, you know, we wouldn't even be able to take a breath in because there's not enough air outside for your lungs to be able to function in the way to breathe them in you're effectively to all intents and purposes in in a vacuum of space and without that atmosphere and without a magnetic field uh you're exposed to extremely high ultraviolet and cosmic ray uh, radiation issues so it, it, if humans are going to survive on mars certainly in the short term we are going to need shielding from those we're going to need to provide an atmosphere we're going to need to have uh everything almost like we would need a spacecraft, but on the surface of, of the planet. And that would need to be sustainable, you know, either by resupply or by manufacturing what you need on the surface. There are an awful lot of challenges uh, to the human body once we get out of our one atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, warm, wet, protected planet. And it is, it is a real challenge. Um, you can make the analogy that, well, if you look look at places like the UAE, that's genuinely, you know, entire cities now built out of the deserts. You know, we, we've shown on this planet that humans can adapt the environment to be able to live there. Uh, doing that on a on a even a local scale on another planet will require a lot of resources, and of course, there are going to be ethical considerations as well when you start talking about, you know, changing other planets and other celestial bodies to to be able to sustain human life in the future so it's it's a it's a massive difficulty um and it has ethical implications but we're very good at figuring things out and we're very good at problem solving and you know i think we'll continue to be good at problem solving until there aren't any other problems so yeah it's an interesting one we are very good at figuring things out when there's a sort of perceived existential risk, as there was during the Cold War, which, let's face it, drove the, the first space race and was the sort of strategic imperative that put Neil Armstrong on the moon. I mean, that was a quite staggering uh, feat of figuring stuff out. But do you think um, that there's the same imperative now? It's diff yeah, it's difficult because in terms of, of looking at, um, Matt mentioned at the beginning, you know, humanity, if, if we're going to survive in the extreme long term, like beyond the 4.5 billion years that our solar system has left before our sun goes red giant and, and expands, then, then undoubtedly humanity is going to have to leave the planet. Um, and the timescales that we'd be looking at, I mean, we, we have the technology and the ability 
to have people survive on Mars at the moment. It can be done. It would be dangerous. There would be losses almost certainly, uh, but not in large numbers and not in a sustainable way. The, the time it would take uh, for changes, certainly with current technology, would be very long. But what we've seen with the commercial um, space program is the acceleration of technological development that's occurred when, when you've had this, um, this program go on. And not only in that, we're seeing even on a local scale in the UK with uh, the announcement of spaceports that smaller local UK um, uh, businesses such as Orbex and Skyrora, you know, they're working on developing new fuels, biofuels that will be less polluting and more efficient. So we're seeing technology, technological jumps occurring already as a result of this, this commercial space race. So it, it, it does kind of blow it open, but I think from an immediate standpoint, you know, the timescales that we're still looking at before we have sustainable habitation on another planet, we're still a long way off that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, I just want to give um, Sarah and Matt one last uh, word each, and I'm sorry those uh, who uh, might, may feel uh, sold short, uh, we can't always get to everybody. Um, Sarah, you um, have spoken a good deal about the sort of current uh, commercial situation, but cast your mind forward. Do you think that we're going to become uh, an extra planetary, a multi-planetary species in your lifetime? Well, depends how long we live for. That's an impossible question, isn't it? Um, we shouldn't put timescales on this, but the goal is to make humanity a multi-planetary species to extend our presence beyond Earth. I think for many outside of the space industry, change is happening a lot faster than you realise. I think in, in some ways there's a lot of STEM illiteracy within the media, which is why there's so much confusion as to what's happening. You know, I, I work as a journalist. I've got an astrophysics degree, also a journalism qualification but um, a lot of the media don't really understand science and they're not prepared to get it wrong they just want those headlines such as billionaires doing this or whatever so I think there is um we, we need to realize there's a lot more change happening than you might realize change is happening faster than we realize but within our lifetime humans living on other planets as a, as a colony that's very unlikely but we will you know within the next few decades we could answer the question are we alone or not in the universe we could likely find evidence of past microbial life on mars we will likely this decade see human beings return to the moon um i hope um there's 11 year old rupert i think um, your generation rupert um you're the generation that's going to walk on mars like our mars walkers are among us today they are school aged children so in the next four or five decades, we will see human beings set foot on the surface of Mars, or set foot on another world and look up in their Martian night sky and see the Earth like a dot, like a star from the planet Mars. So we will see huge changes, things that we can't even begin to imagine over the next few decades. And that's what excites me. It's all the stuff that we can't imagine. If I, if I knew what was going to happen, I'd have to have a crystal ball. Thank you very much. Matt, um... What uh, Sarah mentioned, are we alone? And the other question I asked was, will we get to Mars? What, what do you think, assuming Starlink allows you to continue being an astronomer, uh, is the most exciting question that uh, human sp space exploration might answer uh, in your lifetime? It's a really good question. I'm, for me, human, ex human space exploration is less about answering questions and more about discovering what can be done. Um, we have been able to discover an enormous amount about our universe uh, from right here on Earth, right? I mean, so some of the most profound scientific breakthroughs over the last century, like discovering, I mean, at least in my field, right, kind of discovering the, discovering the origin of the universe and discovering uh, what happens when stars are born and die and all the rest of it, we have discovered right here on Earth. Um, I think human space exploration, I think, is hugely important for all the reasons that we've been talking about. And uh, like, like Sarah said, it's that aspirational thing, right, that young children nowadays can look up and realize that they might well be the generation that can walk on these other planets. Um, I, I'm not sure we, we might be answering fundamental questions by doing it, but I think we'll be serving maybe a slightly different part of our humanity, right, like uh, that urge to explore. Um, so if, yeah, for, for me, human space exploration is, is less about answering questions and more about learning what we're capable of and laying the groundwork for our future in space. 
Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. It's been really interesting. With three minutes past, I'll be very, very quick uh, in trying to sum up because um, we've got an answer to the question, why go to space? And it, it, it turns out to be the answer that I used to use when, when writing leaders about this for a newspaper. It's because of who we are. I think insofar as people agree that it's worth continuing to strive for this next frontier, it, it is not really for concrete scientific reasons. It's because, it's because it is in our DNA, uh, it's who we are, as, as, as I scribbled down that just now listening to Sophie. Uh, but we've learned some really fascinating things, not least um, uh, from Rupert about the United Launch Alliance, uh, the reusability of SpaceX's rockets. Uh, thank you, Rupert. Um, and uh, I personally, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we're still in business. Sorry, it's like that occasion when the, the, the North Korean expert was interrupted by his wife and children. Um, uh, I personally will, will take away uh, Sarah's uh, passion for the latest iteration of what I will call just one more time the space race, not as uh, billionaires competing with each other, but as massively successful people choosing to throw their resources into a field of research that might otherwise be vacated by governments which inevitably are more preoccupied with matters here on Earth. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, do join us again next week, and especially for the next Sense Maker Live next Friday. Have a great weekend.